Well, good morning. Um, spoiler alert. Alex and I did not plan this, but there is a major theme in what Alex just said that is extremely important in today's passage from Romans 11. And that is the world looking at us and being envious. Uh, you're going to see that show up. And, um, and for very much the same reasons that Alex talked about. Um, I'd like to open our time before we dive into God's word in detail uh, in prayer. So would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we have just declared that your love is incredibly deep, deeper than what we can comprehend. And that was demonstrated on the cross in a way that we can never, ever deny. But as we're going to see in today's passage, that there are times that we actually live as if it, it's something we just take for granted. And so, Lord, we ask for your help this morning as we look into your word, that we would be challenged and we would not take it for granted. We would recognize that you are the one who preserves and protects us and provides for us. And, and we declare that to you even as, we, um, even as we have sung this morning, as we have given of our offerings to you either this morning or through the week or through the month, Lord. Um, and now as we come together to look into your word, we declare that you are the God who cares for us and watches over us, and that your love for us is deeper than what we can comprehend. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I um, knew someone years ago that was an extremely gifted piano player. Extremely gifted. And he was extremely gifted from the time he was very young. Uh, the story he told me was that when he was 10 years old, and he was telling me this as probably a 30-year-old, uh, when he was 10 years old, he entered his first major competition. And this was a major competition. This was the sort of competition that would have adults in it and people who were trying to move in through life to become a professional um, piano player. And so it was the sort of thing that as a 10-year-old as a was remarkable that he was in this. And uh, it was also something where the music was very long, was very complicated, and it was played from memory. And so this little 10-year-old boy, his name was Jamie, walks up to the piano when it's his turn. He sits down, and he plays flawlessly. Every single note is right precisely on time every single note is the is done exactly the way that jamie wanted to do it and he walked off that stage and in his mind he knew he had blown away all of these older competitors until he got the score and as jamie the 30 year old was telling me he could now look back and see that what this judge was trying to do was find something nice to say to this 10-year-old. Because all he wrote was, you have a good memory. Not exactly what he had hoped for. And what Jamie explained to me is what he learned in that moment, or began to learn from that moment, is there's a difference between someone who can hit all the right keys at exactly the right time, and someone who's truly a good piano player. Because someone who is truly a good piano player is going to be filled with the music, is going to understand that there is power and emotion that is being communicated through this music, and he will enter into that, and it will flow through him. And as a 10-year-old, what he knew how to do was hit the right key at the right time. There is a way of relating to God that is very common in this world that comes down to hitting the right key at the right time, but knows absolutely nothing 
about the power and the passion of a life that is with God. And that is something we are going to encounter as we, this morning as we continue through the book of Romans. And God has a plan for dealing with a Christianity that gets all of the technique right, but gets the heart wrong. And we're going to see this in Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 24, which is where we are as we're working through the book of Romans. And what we're going to see is that God has a plan for dealing with Christianity that gets technique right and the heart wrong, and that we have a role to play in that plan. Now, to help us understand Romans 11, uh, 11 through 24, let's just remember what the context is. From the beginning of chapter 9, Paul has been addressing a series of questions. Each sermon has taken a look at a different question. And the questions all center on one theme. And that is, if Jesus was the Messiah, if he was the Savior that was promised to Israel, that Israel had looked forward to for centuries, why is it that when Jesus actually shows up, Israel rejects him? And and he goes through a series of questions to address that problem. And what has come out as he's addressed those questions is that, that God has faithfully pursued Israel. He has done everything necessary to pursue Israel. But the problem is not with God, and it's not with with Jesus as Messiah. The problem is the hardness of heart of the people. But despite that, Paul has shown that God is still going to preserve a remnant of Israel. He is, even these people who are rejecting Israel, God loves them so much, cares for them. He is still going to pursue them. Today's question that we're going to see is the question of, does Israel actually have a future? Does God's plan include Israel, especially given all the hardness of heart that exists? And this passage breaks into three paragraphs. And in the first paragraph, we're going to see that there is hope for Israel in God's plan. The second paragraph is going to show that God's plan is an eternal plan. It's a plan that, that, that carries into eternity and addresses the problem of death. And then finally, in a very challenging last paragraph, we're going to see this picture of an olive tree that is designed to, to show the humility that is needed for those who have a role in God's plan, which is all of his people. After we look at the passage and really try to understand what it's saying to us, I want to draw some parallels between what we see in the people of Paul's time and what we see in our culture today. But let's start with looking at the first paragraph, which is verses 11 through 12, where we see that there is hope that is found in God's plan. Paul says, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So here's our key question that we started at the beginning. Did they stumble in order that they might fall? Let me modernize this question for us. It's, help, I've fallen, can I get up? That's the question. It's, it's they have stumbled over a rock, and, and, and the question is, have they fallen so badly that now they are just totally out of the race? And Paul gives, again, as he has in each of the other questions that have been raised, a very strong negative, not a chance. The race is not over. There is more to the story. And what he shows here in this first paragraph is that their hardness of heart has brought salvation to others. And it has done that for a purpose. And we're going to come back to this word jealous because you've heard um, Alex refer to this, but we're going to come back to this later. This is a key word. Verse 12 introduces what is really the key theme through this entire section of Scripture. And, And it's a, if this is true, how much more is that true? If the hardness of their hearts, that's what the trespass and the failure means. 
means blessing, means salvation to the world. How much more will the softness of their hearts when that that happens mean? How much more blessing will that give? And that's a theme that's going to keep echoing throughout throughout this whole passage. Now, let's just stop right there for a second and reflect on what has he just said about who God is? What he has just said is that our God is a God who is motivated by, who desires deeply salvation and blessing. And God uses every situation, even those whose hearts are hard, to bring salvation and blessing. I also want to point out to you that um, if you have someone in your life that you love who is a person whose heart is just hard towards God, they just don't want anything to do with God, I want you to take encouragement from these verses. I want you to recognize what they are saying. God has a way of reaching into hard hearts and saying, this is not the end of the story. God has the ability to work in and through even the hard-hearted. Now, the next paragraph builds on this first paragraph by, by taking God's plan into the future. And it starts in verse 13. Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my men somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous. There's that word again. And thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Well, even here, it's starting to get a little strange. Trust me, it's going to get stranger in the next paragraph. Um, but let's take a look at this. And, and again, what we're going to see is that God's plan is also a plan for their salvation, for the blessing for the future. Now, notice that Paul has kind of changed his audience here. And, and if you were with us kind of in the first several weeks when we talked about the book of Romans, one of the things we talked about to a church that has both Jews and Gentiles. And at this point, it's like Paul is turning to the Gentile section. You're the Gentile section for this morning. And is saying, okay, people, I am talking to you. I want you to catch this. And what he wants to do is he wants to address how they need to be thinking, what their attitude needs to be, given their role in God's plan. And Paul reminds them that he is their apostle. He has a special relationship with them, but even in his role as their their apostle, he has a purpose that includes the salvation of the Jews. Paul's role in God's plan is to make his fellow Jews jealous. That's his role, and I'm going to argue that that is our role as well. Verse 15 uh, carries the same thing that we saw in verse 12, right? Their hard-heartedness brings blessing, brings salvation beyond just the hard-heartedness of those Jews. So how much more will their soft-heartedness bring blessing and salvation? But here he defines what he means by blessing and salvation. It's life from the dead. And what he is talking about is the future that we all look forward to. And salvation means living in the very presence of God for all eternity. And he's saying that that is what is awaiting the people of God. Verse 16 sounds very bizarre, but you have to understand there is a practice that was taking place in their culture that helps make sense of this. What the Jews of Paul's time would do is when they would break bread, uh, or not break, when they would make bread every morning, they would take a small lump of the dough and they would set it aside almost as an offering to the Lord. And the idea was that by doing that, 
the, the Lord would, would bless the entire loaf. And in fact, beyond that, he would bless the entire house. They believe that, that God made them both the, the, the loaf and the house holy because they offered that sacrifice. And so he's really, both with the dough and with the root, the point that God takes something that's even very small and uses it to bless something that is very big. When all Israel believes the gospel, death will be defeated and the final day will come. That's, that's what he's saying here through verses 15 and 16. So what's God's plan for the future? It's the conquering of death. It's eternity in God's presence. It is salvation even for the hard-hearted. What is Paul's role in that plan? It's to make the hard-hearted jealous. So let's take a second and talk about being jealous. The word that's translated jealous in this passage shows up only four times in the New Testament. Two of the times are in this passage. And the idea that is behind this word is, is the idea that there is someone that you care about and someone that you think should love you, but you have this fear, this feeling that they are rejecting you for someone else. You ever felt that? If you, like, have ever been a teenager... Um, that's the emotion that, that he's trying to capture here. And so think about the dynamic of that as that applies to Israel, to these people who are hard-hearted. They think they are the ones with the special relationship with God. God is supposed to be theirs. For them to be jealous means that, that they are now looking at God's relationship with the Gentiles and they are feeling that somehow God has rejected them in favor of the Gentiles. And they are saying, God, you are supposed to have that kind of relationship with us, not with them. That's what Paul is trying to stir up inside of them. Quick aside, this is for free. When the Bible talks about God being jealous, what's he talking about? It's talking about God looking at us in our hearts saying, your love is supposed to come to me, but you are sending it after something else. And I want your love. You, the best thing for you is that you love me. I really want us to understand this dynamic of, of what was going on with the, with the jealousy that Paul was trying to create with the Jews because I think it is really relevant to us today in East Texas. When Paul talks about the hard-hearted, remember how he has described them up to this point in the book of Romans. He has basically talked about, it's the exact same thing as when he is talking about people who are trying to have a relationship with God based on works. To the hard-hearted person, a relationship with God means this. It means you're from a blessed nation, right? They're from the nation of Israel. You're part of a God-fearing family. You're part of the, the line of Abraham. You are to be a nice person. You are to do good things, right? Follow all the law. You are to do all the religious things, right? You go to the synagogue. You, you, you do all of the festivals and all of the holidays that are required of you. And you support religious culture. And Paul has said through Romans that if that is your relationship with God, it's going to produce one or more of three things. You're either going to be proud because you actually think you're accomplishing it. Or you're going to be in despair because you've, become, you've come to the reality that you can't accomplish it. And you'll almost certainly be exhausted from trying to accomplish it. Let me ask you a question. Does this remind you of anything you see in our culture? Does this remind you of a lot of people in the Bible Belt who think that what it means to be in relationship with God 
is to live in a country that is blessed, be a part of a God-fearing family, do all of the right things, avoid all of the wrong things, and make sure they do all of the religious things and participate in religious culture. You've got to make sure you have Christian radio in your car. You make sure that you go to church on Sunday. You make sure that you say and do all the right things. And they believe, and it is what I believe for much of my life, that means to have a relationship with God. So let me capture for you what Paul has been saying is true intimacy with God up to this point in Romans. True intimacy is an awareness of and a trust that God is present, that he is at work in your life and in the world, and that God's character is good and can be trusted. It is just and righteous and holy and also gracious and merciful and compassionate. It is confidence that God is the source of your provision and the source of your protection. And what true intimacy with God produces is a desire to know God better, a desire to be like Jesus. It produces greater faith, greater hope, greater love, even in the middle of crisis. Here's God's plan. God's plan is to take people who get this who understand what true intimacy with God is and drop them into a world filled with people who think that. And that is still God's plan. We live in a world in East Texas of people who think that's what a relationship with God is. And what they need to see desperately are people who lives something very, very much deeper. These people, people with intimacy with God, may do all of these things. They probably will be characterized by all of these things. But this isn't their goal. And they don't think that that's actually the relationship with God. It's a means to the relationship with God. It's how you get there. There is hope. There is hope that even the hard-hearted will ultimately experience the eternal future promised to the people of God. And Paul is going to close by using this image of an olive tree to show that understanding God's plan and our role in God's plan should lead not to pride, but to humility. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in their nourishing olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, if you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you are cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? What in the world is going on here other than I am hungry for Olive Garden? <laughs> he is trying to make the argument that being a part of God's plan should lead us to humility. And here's how he is making this argument. He's making this argument through this picture of the olive tree. And there are three important parts of the olive tree that we have to kind of 
come to grips with what he's talking about. There's the branches that were broken off. There's the wild olive shoot that was grafted in. And then there's the root. So what is he talking about with these? Now we enter into the world of deep debate, but I think this is right. The branches that were broken off are the hard-hearted, are the hard-hearted Jews. The branches that are grafted in are the believing Gentiles. And the roots is God's, I don't know why I write on here, it's not like anyone can read it. Um, this is God's saving plan. This is God's history of, of pursuing and saving his people that goes all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Through all of history, God has had this unfolding plan of saving his people. And ultimately, his people will include the Gentiles. And so those are the three major components that we have to pay attention to. And Paul is going to say here, based on this olive tree illustration, here is the command I have for you. And the command is do not be arrogant. And the reason they are not to be arrogant that he gives here is that they are not the ones who support the root. Another word for the root would be the gospel. But it is the gospel that supports them. Now, the next verse, Paul anticipates what their objection might be. Well, what do you mean we have to be humble? Branches are broken off so that I might be grafted in. A, a, a way of saying that in modern terms is, that kid was cut from the team so I could be on the team. What do you mean I'm not better than he is? Here's what Paul says. There is nothing about you that made you better than that person. Why were they broken off? Because they did not believe. And why were you grafted in? Because of your faith. You have no basis to be proud. What you should do is fear. What does that mean? I remember driving in the mountains of Oregon and uh, a semi-trailer was coming the other direction, and as will happen in the mountains of Oregon, uh, it hit black ice. And I could not go anywhere, but it was coming right into my lane. And oh, how? I truly do not know how. It stopped before it got to me. You can imagine that I stopped my car and sat there for a while. Because what I was feeling inside was this deep, deep awareness that I came this close to disaster that I was not going to escape. That's what Paul's talking about here. Do you understand, Gentiles, how close you came? Do you understand, Gentiles, what you have just missed? And it is only because of God's grace. Paul elaborates on this in the last few verses. He talks about the kindness and severity of God. It's kindness to those who have fallen, the hard-hearted, or severity to the hard-hearted, but kindness to you Grace to you, provided you continue in that grace. This is a call to be diligent in your faith. It's not saying you're saved by works. It's saying that, that those who have a true intimacy with God are going to continue in the grace of God. They're going to have periods where they're not. They're going to have periods where they walk away from the Lord. But if, if you don't look at a snapshot, but you look at the overall movie of their lives what you're going to see is, is a long-term characterized by continuing in grace. Verse 23 uses a double negative, but here's the point. 
is that those whose hearts are hardened, if they turn that hardness and it becomes softness, if it becomes belief, they too will be made part of the people of God. And in verse 24, Paul is making the point that if anyone has a special role in this conversation that they're having besides God, it is the very Jews that the Gentiles might look down on. The olive tree section is really confusing. So let me try to summarize it like this. Here's the command. Don't be arrogant. Here's why. Three reasons that he gives in the olive tree section. The Gentiles don't support the gospel. The gospel supports them. The Gentiles didn't earn their salvation. They received salvation by faith. There is no basis for them to be arrogant. And the same rules apply to everyone. And if anyone is special, it's the Jews. That's God's word to us. What in the world does this talk about olive trees have to do with us today? I want to pull out a principle that I think is really important. Spiritual arrogance and spiritual laziness undermine your mission. Looking down on others, spiritual arrogance, because of your relationship with God is going to undermine your mission that God has for you in his plan. See, when I was younger, I, I can remember people saying things like, I'm a lot more spiritual than that person, or, or that person is a bad Christian. Right? That's really obvious spiritual arrogance. But as we get older, we get really good at hiding our spiritual arrogance, and that is because fundamentally spiritual arrogance is an issue of the heart. But it will still show up in things like thinking to ourselves, I know better than that person. I can't believe they did that. I wouldn't have made them that mistake. Or I have so much more faith than that person has. See, the thing about spiritual arrogance is that it might be true that you would not have made that mistake. Or that in that area you have more faith. Or that in that area you really do know better. But spiritual arrogance takes that truth and produces gossip, division, an us versus them mindset, where spiritual intimacy would produce compassion towards that person that would reach out in action to care for that person. Spiritual laziness is taking your walk with God for granted so that you do not care about continuing in your faith. It does not pursue intimacy with God. This person can be incredibly busy at church. They can read their Bible. They can serve. But all of it is done for self, not for deepening intimacy with God. Pursuing spiritual intimacy means seeking to know God better, being more aware of how he's at work in your life, learning to trust him more, living like Jesus because you love him. You might do exactly the same things as the person who is spiritually lazy, but you are pursuing something that is totally different. You cannot... Show someone what intimacy with God looks like if you feel spiritually superior to them. And you will not show someone what intimacy with God looks like if you are spiritually lazy and do not care to pursue intimacy with God. God has a plan. And it can even reach into the hard-hearted and bring them into the eternal life with God that he promises. And that plan invites us to humbly play the role of making people around us jealous by showing the intimacy with God that they so deeply desire. And so here's the point that Paul is making in this passage. Paul is reassuring the Jews and also making sure the Gentiles are aware, are aware that God does not stop pursuing his people. Hard hearts are not the end of the story. 
And then he turns to the Gentiles and he said, and here's the implication for you and it is the implication for us. Make someone jealous for the gospel. Make someone jealous for the gospel. Not because of your hard work, but because you know God intimately. When I hear a piano player who is very good at hitting the right key at the right time, I truly do admire their talent and the hard work that went into that, their dedication. I walk away very impressed by the piano player. But when I hear someone who can hit the right keys at the right time, but is filled by the music in such a way that it flows out of them, my response is very different. Because then the music flows into my heart. It stirs my emotion. It creates a passion in me. It inspires me. I do not leave thinking that the con- leave the concert thinking that piano player was great. I might not even think of the piano player at all. I leave the concert thinking that music was amazing. And that is how I want to be with Jesus. I don't want people to look at me and say, look at how well he did all those things. I want people to be affected by how Jesus has filled me and flows out of me to them. We do these responses every week. And um, let me explain what I'm doing when I do these responses. Not all of them are going to work for you in the sense of not all of them are going to produce a deeper intimacy with God. But each week I try to introduce to you something that if you make this a practice in your life, really can produce intimacy with God. Not all of them will, but every week or so you might hit one and you say, I really tried this. I really did this for a week or so. And And it really is producing intimacy with God in my life that I haven't experienced before. That's the whole point of these. Um, It's not to give you a checklist. I have no idea why this says to rewrite Romans 24 in your own words. There is no Romans 24. Um, What that should say is rewrite Romans 11, 11 through 24 in your own words. And again, rewriting scripture isn't going to be something that is beneficial to everyone, but it is a sort of practice that can profoundly help you engage with Scripture in a way that drives its truth deep into your heart. Another practice is regular, uninterrupted time of quiet prayer, and quiet is a big word there. So is interrupted. So is prayer. Um, But specifically, take, set aside 15 minutes Now, if you already set aside 15 minutes in your week, set aside 20 minutes. Just continue to try to grow in this area where you have uninterrupted quiet time of prayer where the focus is on intimacy with God, being aware and confident in his character, his presence, and how he is at work, his provision in your life. Pray for God to reveal more of his kindness and severity to you. And identify one person in our cultural Christianity who needs to hear about intimacy with God. We are not called to a checklist life with God. We are called to an intimate walk with God. And Paul has told us that as we enter that, God uses that to reach out to all of those who are living a checklist life with God and show them that there is a better way. Would you close by praying with me? (sighs) Heavenly Father, we do come before you and we do confess that so much of how we live is characterized by hearts that may be just a little bit hard. Maybe take for granted what you have done for us in sending your son to live a perfect life, to die on the cross and be raised three days later that we might enjoy life with you now and forever. Lord, that is a remarkable truth. 
and we are sorry that we take it for granted. Lord, help us to live more in light of that truth every day. And thank you that you do and you will. And Lord, help us not to be people who leave here with one more thing to do. But help us be people who leave here who know you better and love you more. That the world around us might look at us and say, that is truly remarkable. I want to understand that. And we ask for your help with that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So here's what we have said about God. God can reach even hard hearts, those who have turned their back on God, those who think they are in relationship with God because they do all the right things. Two different versions of hard hearts. So what is our challenge? It is to grow in intimacy with God. So the hard-hearted people around us say, I want that. You are dismissed. I believe we will have folks from the prayer team who are not high-risk folks uh, at the desk that is to my right in the foyer. If you have anything that you want to pray about, uh, you are welcome to share at that point. And we look forward to seeing you next week.